Let's translate Acts 1, verses 7 and 8. Ipen de pros of tus, uc imon estin noné cronus i kerus, us o patir etheto enti idia exusia. A la limpseste dinamin epelthontos tu agiu nevmatos epimas ke eseste mu martires en te Jerusalem ke en pasiti Judea ke sam Samaria ke eos eschatu tis gis. But he said to them, It is not of you to know times or seasons which the Father placed in his own authority. But you will receive power of after the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in in also Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the end of the earth. So we have our conjunction and then our verb and then our direct object with the preposition. And what does he say? Or what does he say? He says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which I'm just going to put it parallel here, which the father fixed or appointed or placed by his own authority. But now we have a contrast. You will receive power. Dinamine is accusative. Power when or after the Holy Spirit comes on you. So this is a genitive absolute running uh, in relation to receive. As a genitive absolute, our subject is going to be in the genitive. So when the Holy Spirit comes, so here's our subject. And then we have, in this case, our uh, accusative, which takes the place of the object of this participle. So, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be witnesses, but it's actually like this. You will be my witnesses. Now, this is a nominative, uh, but because of the use of me, this is a predicate nominative. So it points back to you. You will be witnesses. Witnesses are equal to you. You'll be my witnesses. Where? You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the end of the earth. So this is a genitive and it's still modifying you will be. The dative prepositional phrase here modifying you will be Data of prepositional phrase here, modifying you'll be. The brackets indicate that this is a textual variant that was undecided by the committee that worked on UBS 
24, Nestle Elan 27. I, I don't know for a fact in Nestle Elan 28 or UBS 5 if it's still in brackets, but uh, in the version I'm working in, it is in brackets. Why? Because the textual witnesses are somewhat divided. The majority of witnesses include N, including some high quality witnesses. So we have Papyrus 74. This is from the seventh century. It's Alexandrian, which is high quality, but it is kind of late, seventh century. We have Codex Sinaiticus, fourth century, Alexandrian, high quality, early date. We have Codex Vaticanus, fourth century, Alexandrian. Uh, we have, uh, I think it's Codex Claremontanus. I can't remember exactly. I'll have to look it up. Uh, which is 5th century. It could be Alexandrian. It could be Byzantinian. I'm not sure in this case. Uh, but in, in this instance, it's the third corrector. So it's not the original text of that manuscript. It's a corrected version. And, and then there's several more witnesses, including the majority text, uh, the Old Latin, the Vulgate. It all includes N. But then we have a handful of, again, high quality and early texts that don't have N. So we have uh, Codex Alexandrinus, 4th century, which is Alexandrian. We have the original Codex Clermontanus, 5th century, Alexandrian. Uh, we have uh, Codex Bizet Canabrigiensis, uh, which is Western, but it's 5th century. And then a couple of other important ones, uh, minuscule 81 and 323, but those are much later, 11th century, 12th century. However, they are Alexandrian. And Alexandrian is considered a top-notch one. Well, what do you do when it's split uh, between uh, two different variants, two different possible readings? Alexandrian is on both sides of the equation, uh, but the majority includes N. Well, in textual criticism, they don't care about the majority. They don't care about total number of witnesses. That's not how uh, the the readings came about to be just in terms of a monopoly. Um, so that doesn't solve anything. And, and basically, you have to look at it, which reading accounts for the others. And if you can answer that, you know you have the uh, most likely accurate text the problem here is we can't account for for the two possible readings uh so for example if n is original and then later dropped out why would it drop out well n is not needed given that a n is before jerusalem so you don't actually need to have it again before Pasi, Yudea, Samaria. So it's just not necessary to have a, a second time. Also, N is dative. And we already have the dative case here. Clearly evident. Pasi, T, Yudea, K, Samaria. So you don't need it because it's already there one time. And we're dealing with the dative case. So it's entirely possible that a scribe looked at this and was like, I don't need this. We already have it and it's dative. I'm going to save some time, save some ink, save some energy and clean this up, make it a little bit easier, or maybe just for simplicity's sake. Uh, some Sometimes scribes would uh, ensure more polished Greek, um, which was evidently true of the uh, majority text of the Byzantine type and lo and behold the byzantine type includes n uh, which is interesting but in any case uh scholars agree that this is a logical uh explanation for if it was original it could have dropped out for that reason conversely if n is not original then why would it then later be added in and uh, they make the case, I don't agree with it, but they make the case that, well, it's added in for symmetry's sake. You have Jerusalem, which is a city. Then you have Judea, Samaria, which are regions. And so to differentiate between the city versus regions, 
N gets popped in a second time in order to show that, okay, first we had a city, now we have regions. And uh, what I find interesting is in that argumentation, they also say that the, the way N is being used here is very Semitic in origin. Well, the author of Acts is Luke, and Luke was not Jewish. So that kind of is a red flag for me. Maybe it's because he's Luke is trying to record what was said. Well, Jesus didn't speak Greek. So is this a tradition of what was passed on? Is he trying to translate from Aramaic into, into Greek? I'm not feeling really good about uh, this, this kind of logic. And so for me, what I think is happening is Luke is taking very seriously uh, what uh, Jesus said to the apostles and faithfully records it down. And to me, it makes more sense that it would be there and then later fall out. And the fact that the majority text includes N, I think, especially when N, the Byzantine text is quite polished, because think of think of it this way, the Byzantine text was the Greek specialists, the Byzantine empire. So it should be polished. And yet here it's not. And so I think that flies in the face of, okay, well, um, usually the Byzantine text is going to polish it up. And here it's not polished. To me, I think that that is a good indication of this is original N is original doesn't make sense from a Semitic standpoint because Luke wasn't Jewish. So from a Hebrew language standpoint, Semitic language standpoint, it, it I, I don't think that argument works. So for me, N was original and later dropped out in a few manuscripts. But in this case, I think the majority text gets it right. Now, what's frustrating is if you go look at the commentaries, uh, they often don't even talk about it so you're not going to find a, a lot of good information there uh, i came up empty in the word biblical commentary the niv application commentary the the new interpreters bible commentary i couldn't find it in nigtc i couldn't find it in pillar so with all these good commentaries i came up empty-handed the only place i was able to find any explanation at all was in bruce metzger's textual commentary of the new testament he does address it. So uh, that was helpful, but uh, no conclusions are provided, which is why it's in brackets, because the committee was just unable to come to a conclusion as to whether they should include it or not. So they included it and then put brackets around it. So now with our diagramming out of the way, we can kind of visualize the text a little bit better um, and also make a little bit more sense of the, the flow. So but he said to them, to the apostles, the ones who had gathered with him, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the father fixed or appointed by his own authority, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the end of the earth. Let's look at our vocabulary now. Uh, Epen, this is Lego. Remember, Lego is an irregular verb. It looks different in the aorist. He said to them, toward them, it is not for you to know knowledge, gnosko, the times or seasons, chronos. This is an indefinite period of time during which some activity or event takes place. Here we go, Acts 1-7. Uh, but also, keros. A point of time or period of time. What's interesting, it could also be a defined period but it could also be a period characterized by some aspect of special crisis. 
And that seems to be what we have here. There we go, Acts 1-7. Kronos is divided into keri, ke, ore in other contexts. And so there's there's some sort of connection between Kronos and Keros, right? Uh, and it has to do with final consummation, which is a fancy way of saying uh, the day of judgment. And the day of judgment is connected with the day, right? The end times. It is eschatological vocabulary. So the context, verse 6, the disciples want to know if it is now the time that Jesus is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. They're thinking politically. They're thinking in terms of nation state. And Jesus is quick to shut that down. He says, it's not your place to know the about the end times. It's not your place to know the times or seasons which the with which the Father has appointed by his own authority. God's in charge, you are not. Instead, Allah, but on the contrary. This comes after a negative. On the contrary, but yet rather. Instead, you will receive power. This is a potential for functioning in some way. Power, might, strength, force, capability. You will receive power, capability, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So, epelthontos is epercome. Uh, this er ercome and its cognates um, are also irregular. And so you can see with BDAG in the future, it's epelevsome. Uh, it's a second aorist, apil um, So this is ap elthontos. This is the aorist tense stem. And uh, as a result, because it's a participle, um, we have to use, especially because it's connected with um, lambano, it's, it's got a contem contemporaneous adverbial flavor. So we're going to say after uh, has come, after has come, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Ep. This is epi. So the reason why it's F is we have oblaut where um, we have the, the Yoda drops out because Greek does not like having a vowel uh, at the end of this word and then a vowel at the beginning of this word. So the, the, this vowel drops out, we get the apostrophe instead. And then because of this oblaut, the P changes to phi. So this is epi, eth, imas. And, and then because of the apostrophe, you kind of treat this like a contraction in English. So you kind of blend the two together, eth, imas, instead of f imas, eth, imas. And epi means, in general, uh, marker of location or surface on upon near but we're not talking about a location or surface we're talking about people right so that can't be it keep going marker of presence or occurrence near an object or area at or near marker of involvement in an official proceeding before marker of movement to or contact with a goal toward direction of Marker of manner, marker of basis for a state of being, action, or result. That could be it. Marker of addition to what is already in existence. To, in addition to. Marker of perspective, in consideration of, in regard to, on the basis of, concerning, about. Marker of power, authority, control, of, or over someone or something. Over. I think this might be closer to what we're talking about. No, it's not listed here. Marker of legal proceeding before, marker of purpose, goal, result two or four, marker of hostile opposition against, marker of number or measure, marker indicating the one to whom, for whom, or about whom something is done, to, on, or uh, about. This could be it. 
And there we have Acts 1 8. So under 14, marker indicating the one to whom, for whom, or about whom something is done. So translate it as to, on, or about. This says with dative, we don't have the dative, we have the accusative. So now we're going to come down here, accusative, and it's under not uh, man, the man on whom the miracle had been performed, but rather of powers, conditions, etc., which come upon someone or under whose influence someone is. Translate it as on, upon, to, over. So example, uh, Agenato rima theu, epi, Yoanin, the word of God came to John. Uh, so we have our example down here, Acts 1 8. Uh, various verbs are used in reference to the Holy Spirit, either in passages, passive rather, or active role in connection with Epi Tina. So we're going to translate it on you or upon you. And you will be my witnesses, Martis, the one who testifies in legal matters, witness, one who affirms or attests, a testifier, a witness. This is the transferable sense from meaning one we just saw, uh, but without the legal aspect. And that seems to be what we have here. There it is. You will be my witnesses. And then en te Yerusalem. So let's look at te. Te is an enclitic particle. Uh, so it typically doesn't have the accent. Instead, it passes the accent on. So in this case, it's missing an accent. And N, which doesn't usually have the accent, suddenly has it because it transferred from te. So N, te. Uh, te means and, likewise, or and likewise, and so. But we need to look at it in context to make sure we get this right. So marker of close relationship between sequential states or events, that's not the case. Marker of connection between coordinate non-sequential items, maybe that's it. Uh, if it's used alone, it's just and. So it can't be that because we have K here and you will be my witnesses. So it's not used alone. We don't have two instances of te with the same meaning te k. Now we're now we're cooking. That's that's what we have. We have te and k. Another k here. Another k here. So it's possible this is what we're dealing with. Connecting concepts usually of the same kind or co correspond, corresponding as opposites. In these uses, te k can often be translated simply and and you will be my witnesses in and Jerusalem. That doesn't make sense. Compare Acts 1-8 here. So, es theen te ke penin ke methis keste. Te ke penin ke methis keste. 1245. They can be followed by more than one K. I think that's what we're talking about here. The parentheses ends here. Then we have our example with Luke 2.16. Then an example with Luke 12.45. And then more examples here. Okay. So te can be followed by more than one K. So te, K, K. Okay, and this is all under the heading connecting concepts. So I don't think we need to translate te here, but what it's doing functionally is showing us that there's a connection between Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, and then Eskato, Eskatu. So we're not going to translate te. If we really wanted to translate it, maybe we could throw in indeed. And indeed, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. But I don't see any basis for translating it as indeed. Well, 
Mark her with a sense of stress and serving without copulative force, even. Uh, so for, suppose I even do boast a little too much. And tegar peris, perisoteron ti kavkisome. But I'm not... I don't, I'm not willing to do that here. I don't think we need to do that. Te K connects the second and third members of a series, and another K joins the fourth one. Yeah, I, I think it's just we're dealing with a series. So you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, then in all Judea and Samaria, and finally unto the end of the earth. So we have Yusalim. This is uh, Yusalima, Jerusalem. We have Judea. This is from Hebrew Yehuda. We have Samaria. This is Samaria. And then Eos. Eos means until. It denotes end of a period of time but there's no time aspect here so we're going to keep looking to denote contemporaneous that's still time marker of limit reached now we're now we're talking as far as to and it functions as a preposition so we have with genitive of place as far as this is genitive eschatu is genitive singular so this is this is exactly what we're talking about right here. I'm going to translate as far as as far as the end of the earth, eskatos. So usually this means last and it it can mean a boundary of an area. So that's a physical space uh, pertaining to being the final item in a series, least last in time. Uh, with reference to a situation in which there's nothing to follow. Uh, the the last and um, it can also mean in uh, most insignificant least so uh, what's interesting is initially the disciples ask is now the time heros heros is uh, vocabulary for eschatology and then in the final word Jesus uses Eschatos. Eschatology comes from this word. So the irony here is that it is not for you to know the end times. You don't get to know the program. You don't get to know about when God is going to send his son to return. You don't get to know when, when Jesus is going to come as the conquering king, Messiah, uh, that's not for you to know. God's appointed that time. You need to trust God with that. Instead, you're going to be my witnesses into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So this is somewhat tongue-in-cheek, somewhat of, of some irony. Dare I say, even a pun. He's throwing it right back into their face. You want to know about the end times? You're going to take my witness to the end of the earth. You're going to go testify about me to the end of the earth. That's your end times. Now, what's cool about this is this is fulfillment of scripture. This is fulfillment of Isaiah. So here's our Greek text on the left from Acts 1, verse 7 through 8. Isaiah 32, 15, until a spirit from on high is poured out on us and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. This is the important part right here. Until a spirit from on high is poured out on us. So note the connection here. Pnevma. Pnevma. Compare with, look at Isaiah 43, 10 through 12. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I am. I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, says the Lord. Here's that term, martiris, martires, uh, martis. So you will be my witnesses. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. And the last one to see 
Isaiah 49.6. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. He said to me, it's no great thing uh, to call you my slave, my child, to stand up the tribe of Jacob and the diaspora of Israel, the survivors of Israel, to return or restore. Behold, here's the appointing, appointing, I will appoint you to be a covenant to the nations. of of light to the nations. So Genus is family, uh, race, kind, offspring, generation. Genos, rather. To be a light to the nations. In order that my, well, my is not there, in order that salvation unto the end of the earth, our exact phrase right there, eos as eschatu tis gis. So Jesus is quite actually working out Isaiah 32, 43, 49, right here in Acts 1, 7 through 8. Now notice the flow. It starts in the city that they're currently in. They're just outside of the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the capital of Judea. That's where their mission is to start. From there, they're going to branch out from Jerusalem into Judea, which is the surrounding nation uh, or, or region that Jerusalem is within. From there, they're going to move up to Samaria. Now, Samaria uh, used to be the... Uh, the capital area, the capital city for the northern kingdom of Israel, when there was the two nations, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You had Israel to the north uh, and Judea to the south. So now you're going from Judea to Samaria, and that restores Israel in and of itself, right? Or is a ministry to Israel, I should say. But then that is the launching pad unto the end of the earth. So just as Jesus's ministry was to the people of Israel, to the Jews first, then to the Gentile, right? So also is his program for his apostles. Start with the Jews first, then work towards the Gentiles. And we see that happen immediately. As soon as the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, Peter proclaims the word of the Lord and uh, what is it? Two or 3,000 people come to know uh, the Lord that day. That's in Jerusalem. Then very quickly, Philip encounters someone from Africa, right? The Ethiopian eunuch. There's a Gentile. To the Jew first, then to the Gentile. And that pattern pretty much runs throughout uh, all of Acts, and then the program, Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the end of the earth. That's what happens throughout the rest of Acts. Go figure. Now to translate, but he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and unto the end of the earth. If you liked this video, hit the like button, brush up on your Greek and Hebrew, and we will see you next time.